All right, welcome to a new video. Uh, we're gonna shake things up, do something new today. Um, last uh, video I did on uh, a book called uh, Python for or DevOps, and uh, the last three chapters of it were just, um, uh, they had lots of typos in them. Uh, they didn't really seem relevant to somebody who actually knew Python or was interested in Python. And um, not only that, there's a lot of other things I, I want to to do and to just continue on with this, that book is, um, I think, uh, denying me of the chance to work on, on those other things. So we're going to do that today. We're going to work on a book about how to uh, have really uh, solid professional Python projects. We're going to be learning about Python instead of um, <laughs> a book that uh, doesn't know how to do Python. So uh, this is this is called uh, Architecture Patterns with uh, Python, but the the name of, of the book is uh, Cosmic Python because um, when they actually brought it to market, they decided to change the name to Architecture Patterns uh, with Python. So we're going to want to enable test-driven development, domain-driven design, and event-driven microservices. That is what I want. Okay, so let's start off with the preface and um, the other uh, thing I've been doing um, is is using my uh, blog site that I've, I've been paying for I have my domain name space so nobody can uh, take that from me and, and put up a <laughs> offensive site um, with my name attached to it so um, I've been um, going over the pros and cons of, of different self-learning methods. Um, the ones I have done so far is uh, Amazon Kindle Books, free online books and tutorials, uh, paid in-person classes. I actually went to a uh, two-year school um, and have a degree in uh, applied uh, science in, 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 uh, from a, a Cisco networking academy. Um, and, and it was uh, I got some general ed credits as well. Um, so this is uh, probably um, one of the options I have the most experience with because yes, I've done a lot of self-learning for my certs and stuff, but um, I, I would say this is probably the second option I have the most experience with. It's just using free uh, online resources. So um, this a, a big part of this series is to explore: Is it worth it to buy an Amazon Kindle book? Is do you get something more than you get with uh, online books and tutorials if you spend a little bit of money? And uh, so far, I would say the answer to that is no. Um, your best resource is is a free online book and tutorial. Uh, save the money if you want to learn about Python. Go to a site called RealPython.com. Um, and then just plug in whatever you want to learn about. So I want to learn about network engineering. So here we go. We've got, uh, we can learn all about um, Python's IP address module, save ourselves um, um, some, uh, the risk of making math errors by just using that to do all our subnetting and stuff. Um, we can, uh, um, yeah, so that, that's it. Um, that's all I've got for that. But um, the other the other thing um, I have on here is uh, uh, so I so paid in person classes is not just um, I guess I guess I would put because the the other thing I highly recommend that I that I have uh, done before and, and that have really paid off for me is. Um, you go to gns3.com, you go to training, and you click get started. Um, and this takes you to the GNS3 Academy. And yes, David Bumble is, is basically like the face of this site. He's, he's become, I, now when I first joined this, he actually wasn't on here. So for me, the most valuable courses have been from Mihail um, Catalin. Um, but um, from what I've seen of, of David Bumble, it, it's very, very high quality. So I definitely recommend this. I'm not sure which category this end, this belongs under. I guess I would say um, 
it, it uh, belongs under this uh, paid in person. Uh, oh, wait. Paid on. Yeah, so let me make another category, and this is going to be uh, paid in person and paid online. Okay, so paid online. Yep, and then unpaid online is a category as well. There's also a unpaid in person option, um, depending on your city. In my city, um, I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. There's a unpaid in person uh, mentorship club um, that uh, I really recommend if you have something like that in your area, which you undoubtedly do. If you go to um, meetup.com, and guess what? If you don't have it, start it. Like that kind of leadership, those kind of skills are really valuable. So consider yourself having an extra opportunity if that isn't in your community because you can actually set it up yourself and get even more uh, valuable experiences by doing that than simply just by attending a pre existing meetup. But, um, even tending in a pre-existing meetup is a great thing to do. You get there, you go to the first one, and you can see uh, pretty quick, oh, you know, this is great. Um, I'm really going to get a lot of out of this. And then you can decide to go again. Or you can show up and say, you know, this clearly is, is not something that's going to be beneficial for me. And then just go the one time and not go again. The other thing you can do is similar to if it doesn't exist, show up and say, ooh, there's some problems here. It's not working this way. Find out who's who's leading it and see if you can improve it for everyone. Um, that's a great thing to do as well. So, yeah. So there's there's paid online, but there's also there's also unpaid in person, and uh, yeah, and these these can be um, also meetups. These are, I highly recommend um, doing something like this. But um, it's, a, it's and, and some of these two um, aren't um, necessarily exclusive. It's just when you do something, usually it's at the, the ex opportunity cost of doing something else. But you can certainly take a paid in person class, go home and, and take a, or, or go to a mentorship club or do a combination of these. Um, I just list them all separately because uh, typically if you're, if you're going to be going all in on something and, and learning something to the fullest, you, you won't really have time to do uh, multiple things, but you can do one after another. Um, and uh, for a lot of these, um, like if you're doing a paid in-person class and you find a great online resource that, that is free, um, definitely be using that. So I'm just going to put question marks here for everything for now. Okay, except for the the ones that I filled out before. But this is this is new. Um, unpaid in person and this is paid in person so yep and it's getting it's getting to be a bit hard to see the headers so I'm going to be putting those in bold Okay, so here's all the things you can do to just learn on your own, um, which includes uh, paying someone else to teach you. That's one thing you can do. Yeah, but this is I might I might want to at some point pivot to to just going through these courses, but this video, um, fortunately, unfortunately, it is off topic. Um, I have a um, plan for this video already, so stick to that plan. It's going to be this Cosmic Python book. But I wanted to bring up my, uh, oops, I wanted to bring up my personal blog 
because this is where I'm going to be keeping notes. One of the disadvantages I had when it came to free resources was uh, note taking. Um, you can't just do it directly in, so you've got to make sure you keep track of that. Otherwise, you lose all your notes. They're not just, whenever you open the book, they're not there for you automatically. If you don't keep track of them, you lose them. So we're going to keep track of them uh, in this uh, location here, my personal blog. Um, so I've got the link and then any notes I find, let's say I want to highlight uh, domain modeling, um, I can uh, take it like this and then I can plug it in here, um, get rid of the link, I just want the text only. And then I can put that at the end of the URL and now it will highlight the first instance of, of that on the page. So. If I wanted to highlight this, I've got to do the one dot at the beginning. And you can you can include spaces, that's totally fine. Um, it'll just fill them in automatically for you with, with the character that is valid for a URL. You can't include spaces in your URL, but you can include um, percent to zero, which is the equivalent of a space. So there you go. This is how I'm going to be taking my notes. I'm just going to be... Uh, including, I'm just going to be saying, uh, this is my favorite section of the book. And then underneath, I can include a link directly to that. Um, oops, I can't make it into a hyper hyperlink though. But what I can do is uh, make it into, uh, yeah, so I can click this here and then paste the link there. Uh, opening a new window for sure. Apply. So now this is my favorite section of the book. Let's see what it is. There we go, and it's highlighted. All right. So let's start with the preface. The preface. You may be wondering who we are and why we wrote this book. At the end of Harry's last book, Test Driven Development with Python, O'Reilly, he found himself asking a bunch of questions about architecture, such as, what's the best way of structuring your application so that it's easy to test? More specifically, so that your core business logic is covered by unit tests, and so that you minimize the number of integration and end-to-end -end tests you need. He made vague references to hexagonal architecture and ports and adapters and functional core imperative shell. But if he was honest, he'd have to admit that these weren't things he really understood or had done in practice. And, and that's the feeling I got from the Python for DevOps book. Um, it just felt like an advertisement from people trying to sell you something and not like a transfer of valuable hard-fought real-world knowledge like there was some of that in there which is why I, I chose to read it um, I was actually pretty excited to read it because I thought there was going to be a lot of that in there but the last three chapters I read there there was nothing like that in there and um, I just decided to move on to this book because it seemed a lot more uh, relevant and valuable to me um, at this time and then he was lucky enough to run into Bob who has the answers to all these questions Bob ended up as a software architect because nobody else on his team was doing it. He turned out to be <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty bad at it, but he was lucky enough to run into Ian Cooper, who taught him new ways of writing and thinking about code. There's a, a quote um, called, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Um, let's see, let's look at that quote. So Philip Stanhope, fourth ill of Chesterfield. Yeah, so whatever, so be wiser than other people if you can, but do not tell them so. Whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. The knowledge of the world is only to be acquired in the world and not in a closet. So this is the relevant uh, part of this quote. 
whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. I think uh, my version of this quote is whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing badly. <laughs> I think that's a much better quote because a lot of people will think, oh, I'm just not good enough. I'll never, I'll never uh, get this right. I'll never be able to be an expert at this. Well, if it's worth doing, <laughs> you know, you better do it even if you're not going to do it well, even if you suck at it. Good example, running. Um, I think uh, cardiovascular exercise is worth doing. There's a lot of health benefits in it. Um, but are you going to win the Olympics? No. Am I going to win the Olympics? Absolutely not. In fact, I, I, I'm a total hypocrite for, for saying this right now. But if you get out there, you run badly, you use bad technique, you, use, you don't time yourself, you don't wear the right clothing, you're still going to get all the benefits of, of running because it is worth doing. It'll, it'll make you healthier, even though you're doing it very badly. So I really, um, you know, perhaps this quote is insp inspirational to some people, but for me, a better version of it would be whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing badly. <laughs> Managing complexity, solving business problems. We both work for made.com, a European e-commerce company that sells furniture online. There we apply the techniques in this book to build distributed systems that model real world business problems. Our example domain is the first system, Bob, built for MADE and this book is an attempt to write down all the stuff we have to teach new programmers when they join one of our teams. MADE.com operates a global supply chain of freight partners and manufacturers. To keep costs low we try to optimize the delivery of stock to our warehouses so that we don't have unsold goods lying around the place. Ideally, the sofa that you want to buy will arrive in port on the very day that you decide to buy it and will ship it straight to your house without ever storing it. Getting the timing right is a tricky balancing act when goods take three months to arrive by container ship. Along the way, things get broken or water damaged, storms can cause unexpected delays, logistics partners mishandle goods, Paperwork goes missing, customers change their minds and amend their orders, and so on. We solve those problems by building intelligent software representing the kinds of operations taking place in the real world so that we can automate as much of the business as possible. Why Python? If you're reading this book, we probably don't need to convince you that Python is great. So the real question is, why does the Python community need a book like this? The answer is about Python's popularity and maturity. Although Python is probably the world's fastest growing programming language and is nearly the top of the absolute popularity tables, it's only just starting to take on the kinds of problems that the C Sharp and Java world has been working on for years. Startups become real businesses. Web apps and scripted automations are becoming uh, Whisper Enterprise software. So I don't understand that. I'm not going to whisper it. I don't understand why you would need to whisper enterprise software. In the Python world, we often quote the Zen of Python. There should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Unfortunately, as project size grows, the most obvious way of doing things isn't always the way that helps you manage complexity and evolving requirements. None of the techniques and patterns we discuss in this book are new, but they are mostly new to the Python world. And this book isn't a replacement for the classics in the field, such as oh, Eric Evans' domain-driven design or Martin Fuller's patterns of enterprise application architecture, ooh, okay, which we often refer to and encourage you to go and read. 
So definitely, this is going to be the first note. Um, so we're going to go over here. Um, and uh, I'm going to first make two of these so that there's one I can alter without the other one changing. Okay, and then the first note is going to be further moving. Okay, I don't need to make a highlight in this bookmark, in this, so let's uh, keep on going. Uh, let's do, oh yeah, I've already got bookmark here. So, okay, so let's keep on going. Um, But all the classic code examples in the literature do tend to be written in Java and C++ or C Sharp. And if you're a Python person and haven't used either of those languages in a long time or indeed ever, those code listings can be quite trying. There's a reason the latest edition of that other classic text um, Fowler's refactoring um, is in JavaScript. Oh, it looks like this is a, a third book, so I'm going to save this as well. Let's see if I need to look at the publisher. Um, now is this Ah, here we go. So here's the canonical edition of the book, too. Ah, perfect. Here's the actual book. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Let's go with um, Pearson, because I have some certs from there. So I have an account. though but I definitely have an account because I have search there um, let's see if okay so you need a uh, okay all right well let's just do this um, we're gonna save um, this because um, it looks like a place I can get the book um, once I'm ready to read it definitely not ready to read it yet So moving on to TDD and DDD and event-driven architecture. I think we might have touched on that in the other book. Um, I don't remember it very clearly, though. 
In order of notoriety, we know of three tools for managing complexity. Number one, test-driven development, or TDD, helps us to build code that is correct and enables us to refactor or add new features without fear of regression. But it can be hard to get the best out of our tests. How do we make sure that they run as fast as possible? That we get as much coverage and feedback from fast dependency for unit tests and have the minimum number of slower, flaky end-to-end -end tests. Domain Driven Design, DDD, asks us to focus our efforts on building a good model of the business domain and how do we make sure that our models aren't encumbered with infrastructure concerns and don't become hard to change. Number three is loosely coupled microservices integrated via messages, sometimes called reactive microservices, are a well-established answer to managing complexity across multiple applications or business domains, and it's not always obvious how to make them fit with the established tools of the Python world, such as Flask, Django, Celery, I've never heard of that, and so on. Well, I've heard of, but that, that's not a Python tool. What is, what is it? Yeah, here we go. Configuration files. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what Celery is. It's a distributed task queue. So it's for processing a lot of messages. Note, don't be <clears throat> put off if you're not working with or interested in microservices. The vast majority of patterns we discuss, including much of the event-driven architecture material, is absolutely applicable in a monolithic architecture. Our aim with this book is to introduce several classic architectural patterns and show how they support TDD and DDD and event-driven services. We hope it will serve as a reference for implementing them in a Pythonic way and that people can use it as a first step toward further research in this field. Who should read this book? Here are a few things we assume about you, dear reader. You've been close to some reasonably complex Python applications. I mean, I would say that I, w I would say that does uh, apply to me, but like more of like my experience with Python is just trying to get it to do stuff, like however I could possibly make it, um, and um, less uh, here's a professional Python project um, that I'm looking at um, that that is in production and, and ready to go. More more of what I've used Python for is uh, more simpler uh, applications um, that are that are more self-directed um, so I guess I guess I would say this applies to me though because I have seen um, Python applications um, uh, that were um, so so I, I would say um, this this does apply to me You've seen some of the pain that comes with trying to manage that complexity. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Especially when it comes to logging. Um, I, I've, seen, I've definitely seen firsthand how difficult it can be to set up proper logging for Python applications. You don't necessarily know anything about DDD or any of the classic application architecture patterns. That is 100% true for me. So th this book is definitely for me. We structure our explorations of architectural patterns around an example app, perfect, building it up chapter by chapter. We use TDD at work, so we tend to show listings of tests first, followed by implementation. If you're not used to working test first, it may feel a little strange at the beginning, but we hope you'll soon get used to seeing code being used, for example, from the outside before you see how it's built on the inside. 
We use some specific Python frameworks and technologies, including Flask, SQL Alchemy, and PyTest, as well as Docker and Redis. If you're already familiar with them, that won't hurt, but we don't think it's required. One of our main aims with this book is to build an architecture for what specific technology choices become minor implementation details. Brief overview of what you'll learn. The book is divided into two parts. Here's a look at the topics we'll cover and the chapters they live in. Part number one, domain modeling and DDD, chapters one, two, and seven. At some level, everyone has learned the lesson that complex business problems need to be reflected in code in the form of a model of the domain. But why does it always seem to be so hard to do without getting tangled up with infrastructure concerns, our web frameworks, or whatever else. In the first chapter, we give a broad overview of domain modeling and DDD, and we show how to get started with a model that has no external dependencies and fast unit tests. Later, we return to DDD patterns to discuss how to choose the right aggregate and how this choice relates to questions of data integrity. Repository, service layer, and unit of work patterns, chapters two, four, and five. In these three chapters, we represent three closely related and mutually reinforcing patterns that support our ambition to keep the model free of extraneous dependencies. We build a layer of abstraction around persistent storage, and we build a service layer to define the entry points to our system and capture the primary use cases. We show how this layer makes it easy to build thin entry points to our system, whether it's a Flask API or a CLI. Some thoughts on testing and abstractions, chapter, th chapter three and five. After presenting the first abstraction, the repository pattern, we take the opportunity for a general discussion of how to choose abstractions and what their role is in choosing how our software is coupled together. After we introduce the service layer pattern, we talk a bit about achieving a test pyramid and writing unit tests at the highest possible level of abstraction. Part two, event-driven architecture, chapters eight through 11. We introduce three more mutually reinforcing patterns, the domain events, message bus, and handler patterns. Domain events are a vehicle for capturing the idea that some interactions with a system are triggers for others. We use a message bus to allow actions to trigger events and call appropriate handlers. We move on to discuss how events can be used as a pattern for integration between services in a microservices architecture. Finally, we distinguish between commands and events. Our application is now fundamentally a message processing system. Command Query Responsibility Segregation. We present an example of Command Query Responsibility Segregation with and without events. Dependency Injection. We tidy up our explicit and implicit dependencies and implement a simple dependency injection framework. Additional content. How do I get from here? Implementing architectural patterns always looks easy when you show a simple example starting from scratch but many of you will probably be wondering how to apply these principles to existing software. Thank you, book. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This, see, I'm so glad I moved on. Um, yeah, there's a fallacy called the sunk cost fallacy where like, you're biased to continue on with something even if that something is harmful to you or, or not. Um, yeah, like I know the last five scratch off tickets didn't win, but which means this next one must be a winner. That's a good example of the sunk cost fallacy where you've put so much time, energy into it, you, you're, you're uh, biased to continue putting time and energy into it because you want to get a payoff for that time and money. So you think you're going to get that payoff if you just keep investing time and money, but no, if you're, if you're down a dead end, your best way is back up out the hole, not digging further down. So I'm really glad I switched books. Um, I might go back to the other one because there was some um, 
the, the next chapters might, might be getting better or something like that, but for now, uh, uh, let's uh, continue on with this. We'll provide a few pointers in the epilogue and some links to further reading. Example code and coding along. You're reading a book, but you'll probably agree with us when we say that the best way to learn about code is to code. That is absolutely true. We learn most of what we know from pairing with people, writing code with them, and learning by doing. And we'd like to recreate that experience as much as possible for you in this book. As a result, we've structured the book around a single example project, although we do sometimes throw in other examples. We'll build up this project as chapters progress as if you've paired with us and we're explaining what we're doing and why at each step. But to really get to grips with each of these patterns, you'll need to mess about with the code and get a feel for how it works. You'll find all the code on GitHub. Each chapter has its own branch. You can find a list of the branches on GitHub as well. Here are three ways you might code along with the book. Uh, way number one is to start your own repo and try to build up the app as we do, following the examples from listings in the book and occasionally looking to our repo for hints. Word of warning, however, if you've read Harry's previous book and coded along with that, you'll find that this book requires you to figure out more on your own. You may need to lean pretty heavily on the working versions on GitHub. Um, the other way you might try to code along with this book is to try to apply each pattern chapter by chapter to your own, preferably small slash toy project, to see if you can make it work for your use case. This is a high risk, high reward, and high effort besides, and it may take quite some work to get things going for the specifics of your project, but on the other hand, you're likely to learn the most. So the final way you might code along with this book is the simplest way. In each chapter, we outline an exercise for the reader and point you to a GitHub location where you can download some partially finished code for each chapter with a few missing parts to write, your, your, to write yourself. Okay, so in summary, the easiest way is to just do the book exercises um, the second, um, the, the, the medium way is to uh, use your own repo, follow along with the examples, um, and, uh, and, and try, to, try to do them on your, your own instead of just filling in, um, doing the exercises, going further, and, and um, actually getting all the examples to work. Instead of just doing the example, doing, doing the exercises, you actually get the examples working on your own. Uh, equipment um, and then the hardest way to do it but the one where you learn the most is where you come you come up with your own project and then instead of just taking getting the examples that give you to work you actually rewrite their examples so that's relevant to your project we're gonna go with the third one the hardest one and uh, the project is going to be uh, automated network stand-ups so it's going to tie right into network engineering and it's going to be basically like Ansible or, or Salt or something something like that, but it's just going to be built from the ground up uh, custom um, according to all of these uh, principles. Um, I found when it comes to using something like NetMiko or, or Ansible, um, sometimes it's just a bit too um, like on rails or like complete and uh, for me it, it's been more useful to just take away all of the extra distraction and and, and just use plain paramico to do stuff so um, we're gonna do that that but we're gonna do it um, at a much um, more advanced uh, level using all of the proper uh, code architecture uh, patterns and models uh, introduced in this book. So let's get started with, with that. Um, I'm going to make a new uh, repo on my GitHub. So I've got to I've got to name it. So here's my repositories. Uh, this is uh, a new repository I made. If you want to get uh, 
a really uh, good um, kind of like uh, news articles. Um, there's a uh, media bias fact check site that will tell you like what are the left, right, um, questionable um, sources. Um, so you can see here's all the left-wing sources, here's all the um, little bit right-wing, mostly center sources, and here's the right-wing sources. Um, so, um, and, then, and then kind of my favorite is um, these sources that are, that are just completely um, questionable and that you really need to be uh, aware of. Um, that you're, you're looking at a questionable source. Um, I think that's a lot of what happens nowadays is, is, and then some of these questionable, even conspiratorial and pseudoscientific uh, sources get, get something that's called wandered, where like even though they came from a site that would be um, considered uh, uh, not a, 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 a reputable site, they'll be taken from that site and, and shown in a more reputable way without mention that they came from a, um, a less reputable site. So, um, but I'm, I'm getting distracted. Um, last thing I'll say is that um, th there's uh, pro-science sources, which I consider are, are the most uh, uh, signal versus noise uh, sources. Uh, and then if you click on, on one of these sources, um, it gives you a uh, pro-science rating, so this has a high pro-science rating, but there are some with very high pro-science ratings. Uh, unfortunately, the, the list it gives you uh, here has uh, no filter for uh, the factual reporting level. So I took the liberty of doing that myself. Everything on this list is the very high uh, factual uh, reporting level. So whatever you want to learn about, um, you can just go to this list and see if there's an article about it on one of these sites and then you'll you'll have a really um, clear and, and unbiased and and, and uh, high factual high scientific uh, kind of exposure to um, whatever topic you're interested in and there's all kinds one of my favorite sources is right here uh, Quanta magazine um, because it's it's more directed towards uh, like your average person so like you can read a you can read about advanced cutting edge mathematics and um, you you can you can enjoy the article even though it's all over your head because they like like every article has like a really good like drawing like like drawings and, and stuff. So I found like a lot of really difficult to understand concepts like twin primes and why like twin primes are exciting uh, and why a lot of like cutting edge mathematicians are studying twin primes right now um, are, are like I can actually get like a sense and be on board with it and be like, oh, okay, yeah, twin, twin primes are something that is, that is interesting to study, even though I don't know the specifics and I'm not a mathematician myself. So that's my favorite source. Sorry, I'm on a complete tangent. This is why um, this is why I sometimes have trouble with self-learning because I'm so easily distracted. But let's go back to where I was. It looks like I went to a different place, um, and then we'll we'll create a new repository here, and we're gonna say um, uh, we're gonna call it uh, Cosmic Python Code Along. code along and then we'll do yeah we'll we'll we'll, we'll do a, a description and then we'll we'll link to the book in the description uh oops it looks like uh that enter key was not the right key to use um let's see if i can uh edit this more what, what if i go back to repos i should see it Ah, here we go. So, can I click edit? I can't. Can I add a description? 
Here we go, settings. Um, no, I don't see anything where I can go and uh, change that description. I'm, I want to give it a better description than that. Uh, I guess I can give it a readme file. Um, let me do that. I'm going to give it a readme file. So first thing we're going to do is Okay, so here's a quick setup if we've done this before. So we need a we need a um, computer a, a, a um, so we're gonna open GNS3 and we need a place to uh, to actually work on this. So we're gonna work on it um, on a Ubuntu server. Um, so so here's my <clears throat> GNS3 project. So we're gonna make a new project. And it's going to be called um, Cosmic Python Code Along. And then, yeah, so what we're going to do, so I guess Code Along is not exactly the right thing to call it because we're not going to be just making the examples work in the book as, as it was one of the recommended ways of following along. We're actually going to be doing a network uh, engineering uh, automated stand-up project where we get um, uh, different uh, topologies of a network engineering. We'll do a data center policy, a, a campus, um, different different kinds of uh, architectures for uh, uh, network engineering, and then we'll we'll have a Python project that uh, stands them up automatically just by uh, creating a device and plugging it in. Okay, so I've actually, um, I'm going to need to, this is going to need to be the end of this video, but I will be back uh, shortly. So this is the end of the introduction to this video. Before I stop it, I will do one more thing. You know what? I'm just going to pause it. Um, I'll be, I'll be right back. Okay, I am back. I do need to stop the video, so I'm going to take my notes um, of where I left off, my, my bookmark. So... Yeah, so particularly if you're intending to apply some of these patterns to your own project, working through a simple example is a great way to safely practice tip. At the very least, to do a git checkout of the code from our repo as you read each chapter, being able to jump in and see the code in context of an actual working app will answer a lot of questions as you go and makes everything more real. You'll find instructions for how to do that at the beginning of each chapter. Okay, so this is just license, conventions, that is totally fine. So uh, introduction is going to be uh, the next section. So I'll do a highlight here. We'll paste as plain text. There we go. Okay, so here's, yep, so now I've got my bookmark. Um, and you know what, let me do this. Um, we're gonna say, uh, this bookmark is gonna be a hyperlink. And we're gonna open it in a new tab. There we go, so here's my bookmark. There we go, and this is where we'll start the video uh, next time. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.